pleasant afternoon to all. I would like to congratulate the PISMIT for a, such a wonderful conference. There has been so many entertaining lectures, very nice and informative lectures. For today, I'm going to be talking about HAP and VAP, making the right choices in optimizing therapy from the clinician's insight. My name is Albert Tofanan. I'm a pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine specialist practicing in China Hospital, Cebu City. So these are the objectives of the lecture. We're going to be talk to we're going to present key concepts from existing guidelines to aid clinicians in the management of HAP and VAP. There are currently three guidelines: the IDSA and ATS from the Americans, the ECMID guidelines from the European, and we also have the Philippine National Antibiotic Guidelines from the Department of Health. We're also going to look into clinicians' insight in the diagnosis and treatment of HAP and VAP. So, what is pneumonia? Pneumonia is the presence of a new lung infiltrate. Plus, there should be clinical evidence that the infiltrate is of an infectious origin. So this usually includes new onset of fever, purulent sputum, leukocytosis, or a decline in oxygenation. So there are three types of pneumonia, community-acquired pneumonia, healthcare-associated pneumonia, which is current in hold, and we will discuss this why, hospital-acquired pneumonia. Under hospital-acquired pneumonia is ventilator-associated pneumonia. So when we say community-acquired pneumonia, this is pneumonia that was acquired in the community. When we say hospital-acquired pneumonia or nosocomial pneumonia, these are infections that usually develop in patients admitted to the hospital for more than 48 hours. That means the pneumonia developed inside the hospital. And this usually is caused by pathogens that are present in the hospital settings. While ventilator-associated pneumonia are pneumonia that occurs in the intensive care unit in patients who have been intubated for at least 48 hours. So they had their pneumonia after the intubation. Healthcare-associated pneumonia was initially presented in the last IDSA guidelines, but what we know now that there is probably no difference from the usual community-acquired pneumonia. In the past, we defined healthcare-associated pneumonia because we thought that these patients would have multiple risk factors of being colonized by nosocomial multidrug resistant pathogens. It used to be healthcare associated pneumonia where patients who have been hospitalized for more than two days within the preceding 90 days, residents in a nursing home or extended care facility who have been on home infusion therapy, chronic dialysis, who had home wound care, or with contact with patients who have MDR pathogens. But what we know now, the patients with these factors actually have infections that are similar to the community acquired pneumonia and these patients are often not critically ill so until new studies come out the use of healthcare associated risk factors are no longer used but we should probably look at individual risk factors to make these patients at high risk to develop multi-drug resistant organisms the health cap again as we mentioned was which was uh, introduced in 2005 ATS-IDSA is no longer used and it has been put on hold and it is considered now as a community acquired pneumonia. Hospital acquired pneumonia is the second most common nosocomial infection and the leading cause of death from nosocomial infections in critically ill patients. Ventilator associated pneumonia is also very common. 14.8 episodes per 1,000 ventilator days. It actually accounts for half of all the antibiotics we use in the ICU, and it is the most common nosocomial infection in patients on a mechanical ventilator. The daily hazard ratio as well of the
3.3%, and then slowly goes down to 2.3% on day 10, and as the days progresses, it's 1.3% at day 15. But there is a cumulative risk. The longer you keep the patient intubated, the higher the chance of developing ventilator-associated pneumonia. High risk for HAP or VAP would be patients with trauma, brain injury patients, elderly, immunocompromised hosts, or patients undergoing surgery. Ventilator-associated pneumonia has an increased mortality. In a paper by Beckert published in American Journal of Critical Care Medicine in 2011, where they look into 4,479 patients, 4.4% of deaths in the IC on day 30 and 5.9% on day 60 was actually attributable to VAP. Nigeli Macau et al. published Intensive Care Medicine in 2010, where they look into 2,873 patients, and they found that 8.1% of deaths on the IC on day 120 was actually attributable to VAP. And those patients, who were having surgery or a higher Apache 2 scores on ICU admission had a higher risk of developing VAP. So let's present a case to make an illustration of what we talk about HAP and VAP. So this is an 87-year-old gentleman with multi-infarct dementia who actually had a trach and peg in 2010 due to a massive CVA. He had been chronically bedridden and actually was in the at home and but was admitted by the family in 2019 because he had a large bed sore and there was some social issues at home. After his bed sore got, got better, the family decided to keep the patient in the hospital even when the bed sore had healed. Six months into admission, the patient developed increased yellow secretions with increased oxygen requirement and a chest x-ray was obtained. The chest x-ray showed, as we see here, this is a patient with tracheostomy, with bilateral infiltrates, predominantly on the left lower limb. The vital signs were stable. The patient had not received IV antibiotic in the last 90 days. There was an increase in oxygen requirement and the patient was not on the ventilator. So how should we treat these patients? To, to aid us with this discussion, let us look into six points. First, we're gonna talk about empiric treatment and how to give it. We're gonna talk about whether to use combination versus monotherapy. We're going to talk about high-risk pathogens and the role of PKPD in antibiotic treatment. Optimal treatment duration will also be discussed. And lastly, we'll talk about innovator versus generic drugs in our treatment of HAP and VAP. So when we try to determine the etiology of HAP and VAP, we need cultures. It is recommended and it is required that all of our patients who we are suspecting to HAP and VAP should have respiratory secretions obtained before any antibiotics is given. This will lead us to a better epidemiology of what the cost is and to enable us to de-escalate treatment. How do we get cultures? Non-invasive sampling with semi-quantitative cultures is preferred over invasive sampling. That is, semi-quantitative endotracheal aspirate is preferred over the use of bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage or protected specimen brush. Of course, these are more specific, but invasive procedure in entails more complications, more laboratory resources, and more expertise. So the recommendation is to use non-invasive sampling. So recommendation for a lower respiratory tract sample, either quantitative or qualitative cultures would do prior to any antibiotic treatment. What is the role of blood cultures? The IDSA and ATS favor blood culture for all patients with suspected HAP and VAP, all patients. Why is this? Because approximately 15% of our patients with VAP are actually bacteremic. And bacteremic VAP are actually at higher risk of morbidity and mortality than non-bacteremic patients. And actually 25% of positive blood cultures in suspected VAP patients are from non-pulmonary sources. You may be surprised when you get your blood cultures that well, all the while you're thinking that this is second to VAP, but 25% of them will actually be from non-VAP pneumonia. And this will also provide evidence of non-pulmonary source of infection and reveal bacteria that is not effectively treatment with our empiric VAP treatment. And of course, it helps with the escalation treatment. So these are the three guidelines that we have. So this was the American Thoracic Society and the IDSA guidelines published in 2016. 
Then, 2017, the Europeans published the ERS, ESICM, Intensive Care Medicine, and the ECMID uh, guidelines for the PAP in 2017. Actually, some of the Americans like Niederman joined these guidelines. And lastly, we have the most current guidelines, which is the National Antibiotic Guidelines uh, published by the Department of Health. We will more be discussing the National Antibiotic Guidelines because this is what applies to our locality. So when we say we need optimal initial antibiotic treatment because it improves survival, these are the following things that we need to do. There should be adequate pathogen coverage. That is, your empiric treatment should hit the usual pathogens. You should give the correct dose. Timely initiation, especially for sepsis patients, would be in an hour. And of course, we should give the correct route, intravenous most often, and that will define optimal treatment. And we know that optimal treatment will lead to improved survival. We also have to balance between starting an adequate antibiotic early and limiting superfluous coverage because broader coverage and longer treatment courses actually increases the risk of adverse drug effects, side effects, and causes antimicrobial resistance. So there is always a balance of using adequate coverage without overdoing it. And early and aggressive treatment is what we usually do, especially in the sicker patients, but we should do early and aggressive de-escalation as well. Once the patient is better and we have our culture results, and now we know that we should probably stop our antibiotics early as well, and we will discuss that. What are the guideline recommended strategies in the selection of initial antibiotic selection in HAP and VAP? These are recommended that we should look at our own local microbiological pattern and local antibiogram unit specific. Actually, unit specific because the CCU, the medical intensive care unit, or the neurocritical care unit may have a different microbiological ecology. And then we look at presence of risk factors for MDR pathogens, which we will discuss and to determine what type of antibiotic to use. And of course, we look at the clinical condition. If the patient is septic, very sick, or non septic at all, and we have time to change our antibiotics. And when the onset of HAP and VAP is either early onset or late onset VAP. And then if we have access to rapid molecular tests, there currently are different PCR uh, diagnostic tests that can tell you what the organism is and that may help you de-escalate initially your treatment. We're going to be discussing the DOH National Antibiotic Guidelines in the treatment of HAP and VAP. The question always we ask is, who do we cover for MRSA for multidrug resistant HAP or VAP or Pseudomonas? The question we should just ask is, have they received prior an IV antibiotic use within the last 90 days? If they have received prior IV antibiotic use within the last 90 days, then we should cover for multidrug resistant VAP and HAP, MRSA, and Pseudomonas. In patients with septic shock, ARDS preceding VAP, or patients who had been hospitalized five days before VAP onset, or who has been on dialysis, then we should cover them for multidrug resistant VAP. So these are the risk factors for multidrug resistant VAP. And who are the patients that increase for mortality that we may need to use a broader spectrum of antibiotics? These patients are defined as one, patients who are on ventilatory support, and second, who are septic shock. So these are the two things that we look into. Okay, so what do we look into? Who do we start antibiotics on with only one drug? And who do we start a combination treatment? Patients we start with monotherapy are patients who are non-septic, who are non-severe, and who has no risk factors for multidrug resistant organism. That means they have not received IV antibiotics for 90 days. So non-septic, they have not received IV antibiotics for 90 days, you can do monotherapy and we'll discuss what those are. If they are severely sick and septic and they have multidrug resistant risk factor, that is they have onset greater than five days hospitalization before VAP, previous antibiotic use within the last 90 days, high rates of MDR pathogen in the hospital when we look at our own local antibiogram, or there's a greater than 25% prevalence of resistant pathogens in your antibiogram, then you should use a combination treatment. So in this case, we have an 87-year-old gentleman whose vital signs are stable, 
no IV antibiotic in the last 90 days, not on the ventilator. So we decided to do monotherapy. And the antibiotic we decided to start was with monotherapy with piperazin and tazobactam, 4.5 grams every six hours. So with looking at the guidelines, if you are not at risk of mortality and no factor increasing the likelihood of MRSA, that means they have not received IV antibiotic in the last 90 days, the treatment options would be peperazin, tazobactam, 4.5 grams every six hours, or cefepim, two grams every eight hours, or meropenem, one gram every eight hours. So these are the accepted monotherapy treatment. If they are not at high risk of mortality, that means that they are not septic or they are not on the ventilator, but they have factors increasing the likelihood of MRSA, then the recommended treatment would be the same drug here plus vancomycin or linezolid for treatment of your MSA. The dose of linezolid will be 600 milligrams IV every 12 hours. In patients who are at high risk of mortality with risk factors for MDR, then the antibiotic option would be actually three. You have to use a combination of gram-negative antibiotic plus MRSA coverage. So you would use peperazin tazobactam 4.5 grams every six hours or cefepime or morepenem or astronaut plus a high dose fluoroquinolone that is 750 milligram IV once a day or an aminoglycoside that covers for your gram negative resistant organisms like pseudomonas that is a dose at 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram IV once a day plus your MRSA treatment which is vancomycin at a loading dose of 25 to 30 then 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram every 8 to 12 hours with a trough level of 15 to 20 or lenizolate 600 milligrams to 12. Unfortunately, most of the centers do not measure trough levels. So sometimes our levels are not really that accurate and that we are probably underdosing our vancomycin. Lenizolid is easier to give at a dose of 600 milligrams every 12 hours. If you have risk factors for multidrug resistant BAP, then we should cover for staph aureus, pseudomonas aeruginosa, and other gram-negative bacilli. So the treatment regimen will be three drugs as well. Your peperazin, tazobactam, cefepine, meropenem, astronaut, plus a high-dose fluoroquinolone or aminoglycoside, plus a vancomycin or lenizolate. So three drug treatment regimen. So in our case, we put our patient on a monotherapy with peperazin, tazobactam at 4.5 grams every six hours. After three days, our culture came out and this was a growth, light growth of pseudomonas aeruginosa which was sensitive to our drug of choice, peperazin tazobactam, sensitive to ceftazidime as well, and cefepime, actually resistant to our carbapenems, sensitive to gentamicin and amication, resistant to our fluoroquinolone. The patient did get better, and we stopped the antibiotic after uh, 14 days with the treatment for pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we're, for treatment of HAP and BAP, it is recommended that local antibiogram be used by healthcare professionals with respect to optimal choice of treatment. And this is to decrease unnecessary use of gram-negative and empiric MRSA if your local antibiogram doesn't show a lot of resistant organisms. If in the absence of local antibiogram, we do have the DOH ARSP guide uh, data which guides us with the current resistant pathogens of the country. These are usually curated from government hospitals from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So let's like look at the antibiogram which was published in 2018. ESBL actually, in most of the government hospitals, are actually very high. ESBL Klebsiella pneumonia, ranging from 23% to as high as 63 to 100%. So ESBL, Klebsiella pneumonia, is high. In our locality, we are fortunate that for our Klebsiella pneumonia, our ESBL organisms is only 12%. And actually, our peperazin tazobactam is still sensitive in 85% of, of the time for our Klebsiella pneumonia. So we don't have a lot of ESBL, Klebsiella pneumonia at this time. The DOH ARSP 2018 guidelines also show that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is still fairly sensitive to the antibiotics that we call our workhorses. So if you take a look here, peperazin tazobactam, the resistant pattern 
is still less than 80%. So for peprazentazobactam, sartazidime, cefepin, and estronam, they are similarly sensitive or there is a decrease in resistance of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In our hospital at Chongwa Hospital, we do have a higher increased resistance of Pseudomonas aeruginosa to peprazentazobactam at 69%. For our third generation, it's 76% and 78%. Our carbapenems are still very good in terms of treatment of our pseudonyls, aeruginosa. And thankfully, our ciprofloxacin is still 86% sensitive for our pseudomonas, aeruginosa. For staph aureus, the Sentinel site showed that in 2018, the MRSA rate is around 53%, with ranges from 32% to as high as 77%. So majority of the staff aureus that grows are actually MRSA. The only good thing though, is that most of these MRSA organisms are still sensitive to clindamycin. Here you can take a look at clindamycin, the dark blue bar. It's around 88% sensitive to clindamycin. Cotrimoxazole resistance a little bit high, now at seven, around 70%, a 30% resistant or only 70% sensitive. Tetracycline is also has a fairly good sensitivity pattern to your MRSD. If you use oxacillin though for staph aureus, that is because they are methicillin resistant staph aureus, up to 54% of them will actually be resistant to oxacillin. In our locality as well, at Chongma Hasso, what we see is that there is a 58% sensitivity of oxacillin to staph aureus. So around 42% are actually MRSA, but majority of them similarly are still sensitive to clindamycin. 89% sensitivity, actually it's also sensitive to erythromycin at 85%, and it is 100% sensitive to lidizolid as well as to vancomycin, Cotrimoxazole is 91%, 81% sensitivity. The only thing though, when we look at our antibiogram is that the incidence of MRSA in our tracheal aspirate is very low. So staph aureus only accounts for 6% of our isolates and around 42% would be uh, MRSA. So only, only around 3%, roughly 2 to 3% of our, of our ventilator associated pneumonia is related to MRSA. Same thing with our sputum isolates here, only 6%. And the reason for it, and with that antibiogram, and this is the reason why most of uh, clinicians in our locality do not cover for MRSA unless there are several risk factors that predisposes them to MRSA. So I, I would suggest that probably looking at our own data would help us guide as to, to rational use of antibiotics locally. So we have talked about empiric treatment and combination versus monotherapy. We're going to be talking about high-risk pathogens, the role of PKPD, optimal treatment duration, innovation versus generic drugs. So these are the recommendations from the DOH guidelines. For MRSA, it is recommended that you use vancomycin or lenizolid. And then they also recommend that we should measure trough level of 15 to 20 milligrams per ml. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, these are the following medications and the doses. Perprazen tezobactam, if you're dealing with pseudomonas, should be 4.5 grams every six hours and consider extended infusion. Or ceftazidime at two grams every eight hours. Cefepime, two grams every 12 hours. Meropenem, one gram every eight. Or if you use tebofloxacin IV, it should be 750 once a day. Or ciprofloxacin, 400 milligrams every eight hours plus combination if you do not know the resistance pattern yet, amicacin or astronaut. Acinetobacter is also treated with meropenem plus amicacin. If you have an MDR strain sensitive only to colistin, they suggest combination of colistin plus meropenem. But in these cases, I would suggest if it's carbapenem resistant or, or multi-drug resistant acinetobacter, that we should probably refer to ID specialists for uh, better care and for their expertise as well. For Klebsiella pneumonia, recommended is if trioxone or levofloxacin or preparazin tezobactam. If it's an ESBR producing organism, ertapenem at a dose of one gram every 24 hours. If it's a carbapenem resistant Klebsiella, we should refer to our ID friends. For E. coli, the first sign treatment is preparazin tezobactam at a dose of 4.5 grams every six hours or cefepime 2 grams every 8 hours, or meropenem 
500 milligrams to one gram every eight months. ESBL strains again are dependent. And again, if you develop carbapenem resistant organisms, it may be best to call our infectious disease colleagues for better care. So let's look at the principles of treatment. For hospital acquired pneumonia, again, it cannot be emphasized, we should generate our own antiviral gram and that our empiric treatment as recommended should also be based on our local distribution of pathogens and our own antimicrobial susceptibilities. And we should de-escalate or modify our treatment immediately once the culture results come out. And the sputum cultures and blood cultures should be done before we start antibiotics. For VAP, initial treatment usually is triple treatment, as we say, MRSA, pseudomonas, and uh, uh, treatment for MRSA, pseudomonas, and other gram-negative bacilli. And treatment should be modified again, de-escalated once we have our culture results. And if the culture shows carbapenem resistance or MDR, where colistin is the only medication available for use, we should ask referral from ID physician. And then we can, it's also recommended that we can use procalcitonin and clinical criteria to guide discontinuation of treatment. Let us now look at PKPD. So we're not going to try to bore you. This is a brief summary of PKPD. Now, the lung is a special organ because it has impaired permeability to a lot of antibiotics, especially antibiotics that are hydrophilic. So beta-lactams, vancomycin, and aminoglycosin. There is impaired penetration and this is the reason why we need to use a higher dose if we're going to treat pneumonia because these drugs are not easily, does not easily penetrate the lung. So aminoglycosides, as we know, has a very poor penetration in the lung and it is not recommended as an initial treatment. It is recommended we use high doses initially to accept, to get trough levels and then it should probably be used as a combination therapy. For beta-lactam, high doses suggested during the initial 24 to 48 hours and prolonged infusion is recommended. Because for beta-lactam and penicillin-based uh, antibiotics, we need the time above MIC to be longer. So if you do your infusion, if you prolong your infusion, then the time above the MIC will also be longer. And this is the reason for recommendation for all beta-lactam antibiotics, including peperazin tazobactam, to be given as a prolonged infusion. And this is the reason why we do multiple dosing every six hours, every eight hours. For fluoroquinolone, the pharmacodynamic treatment is that it's usually area under the curve over MIC. So the higher the peak, the better the, the effect of the antibiotic. So this is the reason why we use 750 milligram higher dose when we're trying to treat pseudomonas. Higher dosing to achieve sufficient tissue penetration and not necessary only for lung infection, but especially for pseudomonas. For vancomycin, low tissue penetration, so less suitable than alternative antibiotics. Linezolid has a better penetration into the lung, and vancomycin usually needed the higher dosing, and we need to make sure that the trough level is adequate. Tegacycline and daptomycin also needs higher dosing for lung infection. And actually, daptomycin has not been launched here and the reason for that, it is not recommended for lung infection because it is actually inactivated by alveolar surfactants. So linezolid actually has a very good uh, penetration if you take a look at it here, 0.93. Tissue penetration of 0.93 compared to your vancomycin, which is only 0.25. And look at your beta-lactam, 0.21, saftazidime, cefepime, 1.04, meropenem, 0.41, peperazin, tazobactam, 0.63. So the doses that we start in critically ill pneumonia is one gram every eight hours for meropenem, and that it is sometimes recommended that we should probably escalate treatment and consider prolonged or continuous infusion. Same thing as peperazin, tazobactam, consider prolonged or continuous infusion. In the Philippines label for tazosin, the recommended total daily dose is 12 grams of peperazin, tazobactam, given in divided doses every six to eight hours. Papers have shown that it can be used as high as 18 grams of peperazin and tazobactam per day, divided doses, if we're looking at severe infections. So these are the doses that we have discussed as well. So what is the optimal treatment duration? It used to be we start antibiotics and give treatment for a long, 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 long time. 
But what we know now that a seven-day course of antimicrobial treatment is sometimes enough, even for hop and buck. There is no difference in short course versus long course. Short course regimen will increase antibiotic free days because you only expose the patient to seven days. And it has been shown that it does not affect mortality. It does not produce recurrent pneumonia. There are better ventilator free day durations and length of ICU stay is similar. So if you use a short course regimen, you decrease antibiotic exposure and hopefully decrease resistance pattern. And studies have shown that the outcome is equally the same. Empirically, they escalate to single broad spectrum as well as recommended once we have the culture result. If you're not sure that you can stop your antibiotic in seven days, you can use procalcitonin to guide this continuation to see if there is, if it has normalized. There are certain instances where a short duration of therapy may not be possible and whom duration of therapy should be individualized. These are patients who we started antibiotic inappropriately. So we pick the wrong antibiotics, so we put them on the correct antibiotics afterwards. You may need to do a prolonged treatment more than seven days. Or patients who are severely immunocompromised, neutropenic, or patients with stem cell transplants. And patients who have highly antibiotic resistance pathogen. That is, they have pseudomonas, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter, or carbapenem resistant enterobacter AAC. These patients need to have prolonged duration of treatment. And patients who are now on second line antibiotic treatment because the first line antibiotic treatment did not work. So if you're using cholestine or tegacycline, you may need to use more than seven days duration of treatment. So this is the last point, innovator versus generics. So we generally have generic medicinal drugs, and these are usually copies of patented drugs marketed at supposedly lower cost following patent expiration of brand leader products. But ironically, sometimes the generic drugs are actually more expensive than the innovator drug, like our own peparazin and tazobactam. So you look at the prices. Generic products are supposedly should comply with standards of quality, efficacy, and reliability. And a lot of the Food Drug Administration, this is a lot of the work of the FDA, to make sure that the generic drugs that goes into our shores are of good quality, efficacy, and reliability. Now, this has been questioned actually by some papers. So this was a paper uh, published by Rodriguez, where they actually looked at the therapeutic equivalence of generic medicinal drugs approved for use in humans, actually in the US where they found out that some vancomycin generic products were actually less bactericidal than the innovator in vivo in a neutropenic mouse tie in capsule model and could induce more resistance of population. So the question is, maybe the strict guidelines that the FDA is currently using to accept the generic drugs may not be enough. So this was a paper published in Clinical Infectious Disease by Tatevan P, published in 2014, where they did a systematic review on the efficacy and quality of antibacterial, antibacterial generic products approved for human use. So they look at all the studies looking at generics. A paper by Chudin Sutter et al. looking at preparazin tazobactam generic product in Sandoz, Switzerland, showed no significant difference in mean and median. So that generic drugs in Switzerland was adequate. Now Jones et al. in 2008 actually did the more extensive study. They took 26 samples of preparazin tazobactam from all over the world. They took 10 samples from the Philippines, five samples from India, three samples from Greece, two samples from China, two samples from Spain, two samples from Taiwan, one from Portugal, and one from Jordan. And they did an in vitro study, look at the incremental MIC antimicrobial assay. And what they found out, that compared to the innovator, all but one lot of generic product demonstrated significantly decreased activity. All of these generic products that were actually tested had a decreased activity compared to the innovator drug, minus 5 to minus 35, an average of minus 16%. Mott et al. published in 2009, 46 data per present 39 manufacturers, 17 countries. They also did an in vitro, in vitro study, look at incremental MIC antimicrobial acid. What did they find out? Compared to the innovator, the range of activity of the generic product was minus 42 to 10 percent, average, average of minus 16 percent. And the range of activity uh, between lots of innovators was minus 19 to 70 percent. So some of them were actually good. 
because some of them uh, crossed the 0%, average was minus 6%. In Silva et al. published in 2010, where they also did multiple samples of reversion tezobactam in Colombia, they found that compared to the innovator, there was no significant difference with respect to potency MIC critical condition. So the conclusion with this systematic review was, he said that the overall conclusions indicate that the published data are limited and heterogeneous, thus precluding any attempt to generalize the study results and that additional evidence will be needed before considering a revision of the marketing authorization processes for antibacterial generic products. So it still varies. So it's not similar to all. There's still a lot of differences between the different uh, generic drugs. So when we look at our generic products, we probably have to look at them individually and hopefully our Food Drug Administration has looked into all these products very carefully. So take home message. It is important to make the appropriate diagnosis and determine risk factors to determine empiric treatment. We should probably use our own local antimicrobial susceptibility data to determine the most effective antibiotic coverage. We should reassess and check culture results at 48 to 72 hours with the goals of narrowing antibiotic treatment. And it is we should probably use a short course of treatment for most organisms except for pseudomonas organisms and all the multidrug resistant organisms. And lastly, not all generic drugs have the same therapeutic equivalence to the innovator drug. I thank you uh, for allowing me to share today this presentation. Uh, we will be answering questions. Thank you. Um, a pleasant good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Albert Rafanan. I'm coming from Cebu City live right now. Uh, we are here to answer questions. If there are any questions, uh, we can go live now. Uh, I see no questions from the chat box at this time. I have no moderator, so I'll be moderating myself. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Okay, I'm just going to ask my own questions. <laughs> One of the things that you usually ask during this presentation is the use of procalcitonin. So when do we use procalcitonin? How effective? So actually both the IDSA guidelines as well as the ERS guidelines do not suggest the routine use of procalcitonin in initiation of antibiotic treatment. It has been shown that probably that uh, in the critically ill patients, sometimes procalcitonin uh, takes around two hours before it resets, uh, it, and it peaks around tw 24 to 48 hours. So if you think that the patient has pneumonia, then delaying treatment while waiting for, for procalcitonin levels to go up may not be a good idea. Though it has been shown that if you use procalcitonin to help you decide on discontinuing the antibiotics, you can probably save on the use of antibiotics. If you use your antibiotics more than, if you habitually use your antibiotics more than seven days, then they suggest that probably uh, you should uh, you should use your procalcitonin level to sorry, procalcitonin level to de to decrease the use of antibiotics. So uh, you can repeat your procalcitonin level if it's normal. Some will define normal as less than 0.5 or less than 0.25, or it could be on the degree of the decrease of the procalcitonin level. If it's less than 80%, then you could probably stop your antibiotic use. Um, there's a question from uh, one of the, uh, what what can you advise is our, if our hospital using generic? Can we increase doses, etc.? You have basis for such. Uh, congratulations for an excellent talk, doctor. Uh, thank you, thank you for, um, thank you for your kind words. Now, it's very difficult for our for clinicians to determine which generic drug really works. There was a time, so that is a reason why we have the FDA to look into the generic products and to look which is acceptable or not. Then the second line of the safety that you have is your own pharmacy and therapeutics committee. In our own hospital, what we do is our pharmacy and therapeutics committee admits one innovator brand and then we admit two to three generic brands. But the two to three generic brands have to have pharmaceutical equivalence. So they have to show paperwork to show that they are of equal equivalence. Now the question is what happens if you don't have those paperwork and you do not know 
if your generic brands really work. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, but it will be, I guess with time, you will notice if the medications will not start working, then you should probably not use this. And if you think about it, those, those, pharmacy, um, those pharmaceutical companies that are actually selling the sub therapeutic levels should probably makonsensya sana sila kasi they are actually killing our patients by giving them sub therapeutic doses and by using sub therapeutic doses we're actually increasing antimicrobial resistance there was a time when um, when we used to crush our own vials of our medicines because some people were actually buying these vials and putting normal saline in this. So that was also one of the problems we had before when we could not assure that these drugs were actually uh, good e uh, equivalents. Um, if there are any other questions from the audience? Thank you very much, Doctor. So generic is always uh, one of the things that we worry about, but um, if the generic drug, we usually use generics because it's cheaper than the originator brand. But if it's more expensive than the originator brand, then we have to double think about how we look into generics and innovator drugs, because we know innovator drugs have been tested and they are a good pharmaceutical equivalent. So we just have to be probably be careful as clinicians. There's another question. Do you think the FDA should require the therapeutic and pharmacokinetic equivalence data from generic makers? I think that's um, that's yes, yes, but that's uh, the government has to decide on that. And I think we have to have stricter generic laws looking into this, but that would be a good idea because that the FDA is our safeguard against uh, importation of fake medications or medications that doesn't work. Are there data, there's another question, are there data on the country of origin that has better generic? Uh, I do not know uh, which data, I would probably say that any generic drug that has been approved for use in the US probably has better, uh, better quality because the FDA in the United States has very strict standards as to what generic products can be used. So, one of the strictest FDA in the world is probably the United States. So they do admit generic drugs and they do have very, very strict guidance. So if the, those medications have been approved for use in the US, then probably uh, they will be more uh, useful about uh, pharmaceutical equivalents. Uh, we know that uh, there was a study that looked into our, some of the products, they took 10 products from the Philippines and. A lot of them actually, uh, all, uh, a lot of them were sub therapeutic levels as well. So we have to be very careful when we use our drugs. Any other questions if there are? Um, again, I thank the PISMID for the invitation and Pfizer for the invitation to share this discussion today. I hope uh, we all learn a lot from this. And if there are no more questions, I think I will end here and I will leave the, the panel and leave the next lecture to Dr. Pamela Ferrer. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Albert. It's raining hard here in Davao City. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, no, yes. I hope COVID is safe there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Rafanan, for discussing extensively your clinical insights on the management of severe CAP, VAP, and HAP. On behalf of the board of the PSMID, I would like to thank Pfizer for partnering with us in mounting the 42nd Annual Convention. We felt that the scientific lessons we will impart in this convention needs to be communicated now more than ever, and your partnership in this endeavor has helped to make this happen. We shall be sending certificates of appreciation for Dr. Rafanan and Pfizer by email. I'd like to thank you all for attending this afternoon's lecture and we look forward to seeing you in the main scientific sessions immediately following this. Please don't forget to exit 
this Zoom webinar room and click on the evening session Zoom link on the convention website. Maayong hapon and salamat sa tanan. Good afternoon, everyone.